Mayor. Um, okay, uh, the recording is sucked. Um, so, uh, hello everyone. Uh, Maria, Marina and I are happy to welcome you to this week's uh, Art in Conversation seminar. Today's session is dedicated to multisensory perception and art. As usual, we invited two experts uh, that have different backgrounds to share their point of view on the same topic. After the two talks, uh, we will open the discussion. Everyone will have the chance to ask a question or share a comment. Either type your question in the chat or raise your virtual hand and we'll give you the opportunity to ask your question. Uh, now, let me introduce our first speaker today, who is Charles Spencer, uh, Spence, a professor of experimental psychology at the University of Oxford, where he leads the Crossmodal Research Lab. Professor Spence is interested in how we perceive the world around us. In particular, how our brains manage to process the information from each of our different senses to form a rich multisensory experience that fills our daily lives. His research focuses on how a better understanding of the human mind will lead to a better design of multisensory food, products, interfaces, and environments in the future. His research calls for a radical new way of examining and understanding the senses that has major implications for the way in which we design most of the things that come to our li daily life, from households, products, to mobile phones, to the food that we eat and places in which we work and live. Professor Spence, thank you very much for accepting our invitation, and please feel free share your screen and uh, start your presentation. Thank you. OK, fingers crossed. Uh, share your screen. So hopefully you can see my slides now. Yes, perfect. Yes, Thank okay. you. So uh, pleasure to be with you all virtually this Friday afternoon from a, a rather cold Oxford um, and to share some of the uh, thinking around um, multi-sensory contributions to art, shall we say. Um, and it's, it's a topic I've been uh, uh, reading and, and writing about a lot this year, but I uh, haven't presented in public. So it may start off with a few nice pictures and then end up as, as more of a sort of stream of consciousness um, to try and get my head around some of the uh, ideas that I sort of think are interesting. And in part, um, my interest in uh, multi-sensory contributions to uh, what is very often unisensory uh, art uh, was fostered by a um, uh, grant from the Lee Hume and from the AHRC by rethinking the senses and uh, um, aesthetics. Um, and in part also by events such as this, we see on the screen um, the Tate Sensorium from 2015, where four of the paintings and art, works of art uh, from the collection were uh, presented uh, to 2,500 people over, I think, about four or eight weeks. Um, and you got to see these four people, works of art while at the same time uh, sometimes eating a chocolate, as in this case of, um, I think, Francis Bacon's Hyde Park from 1907, while also listening to some sounds of sort of distorted mechanical machine-like sounds. Uh, so it's in a way hacking the artwork adding more sensory inputs than perhaps the artist intended uh, by engaging taste, in this case sound, but also by engaging uh, touch and scent as well in some of the other pieces. So this was, I think, my favourite of the lot, uh, John Latham's uh, painting Full Stop from uh, 1969. And the soundscape that one heard uh, was sort of tinkling high-pitched sounds and low-pitched sounds, and it sort of felt like those soundscapes were drawing my attention, the high pitched sounds to the small dots, dusting of, 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 of ink on the, on the edge of the big circle, and the low sounds kind of to the entire whole of that uh, full stop. One was also feeling some virtual ultra haptics in the box uh, as well. So this was uh, much written about, um, but it's one of many now, I think, examples of a more multi sensory approach to the experience uh, of uh, art. Uh, in a way, not necessarily new, I think one can look back in the history of sort of museums and um, art uh, galleries um, and see that uh, many have thought about introducing at least one extra sense to the museum or art gallery setting. Uh, for me, I'm, I'm particularly interested in the use of scent 
uh, hence the title of this uh, historic review from last year. Um, and yet, I think it, as one starts to add more senses to works of art, to make them more multi-sensory, one gets into sort of tricky questions that came out of our Leverhulme um, aesthetics kind of series of workshops. Uh, and we see here David Lomas from the Department of Art History at the University of Manchester capturing the point, um, you know, are we really allowed to hack the art or not? Because this is, if this is not what the artist intended, uh, why should we be interfering? Um, he, he writes, you know, to conclude, it's quite a complicated matter to unpick what's going on with an intervention such as Tate's Sensorium. And doing so is unlikely to change the minds of those who, on the one hand, believe that multi-sensory experience is, ipso facto, a good thing, uh, uh, and definitely better than vision alone. And on the other, those uh, who think that you know, interfering with the picture they see is itself a mild form of desecration. We, we shouldn't be going there. Uh, I think, you know, as well as that question about do we have the right or who can authorise this sort of um, uh, reinterpretation or hacking of the artwork by engaging more senses. Uh, there's a more sort of fundamental question, which is that very often when other senses have been added, such as sent in the context of museum or art gallery or in laboratory psychology studies uh, that are involved, um, scenting the space in which the lab participants view photographic reproductions of works of art then it's by no means clear that the outcome is necessarily positive. Here are just uh, some of the studies that I came across over the last uh, four decades that have typically used very pleasant versus very unpleasant scents uh, and looked at how they affect people's ratings of the paintings, uh, maybe the emotional impact of them, as well as their uh, memory of those works of art subs at a subsequent uh, time. And sometimes the results are positive, other times they are not. So it may be no simple matter to introduce an extra scent and be, you can't guarantee that it will necessarily have a positive impact. Um, if one looks at other sorts of uh, examples I mean, in this space, then uh, my attention was drawn to uh, the Louvre back in 2019, who got together uh, or got eight perfumiers uh, to create a perfume that went together with, that was inspired by eight of the works in the collection. Sadly, when you read the details of this story, you could buy the perfumes in the museum store, but there was no attempt to scent the galleries in which those paintings were uh, hanging or presented. Of course, that might have been challenging in its own right, given that the scent would likely diffuse through a space uh, and any painting is but one of the objects typically in a uh, room. So here, maybe the attempt is just to, you know, to capture a uh, work of art um, olfactorily, whatever that uh, uh, means. Um, in other situations, uh, I've also been interested in how scent has been used um, in uh, other entertainment, perhaps rather than art settings. But there's a rich literature on uh, attempts to introduce scent to cinema, going back over, well, over, over a century, but with its most popular uh, appearance in I guess the sort of 40s, 50s and 60s with smell vision and uh, 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 and such like odorama. Uh, and yet despite all the promises and all the claims of the benefits of adding scent, an extra sense to what is an audiovisual experience, uh, it just hasn't come to pass. We're not all watching 4D cinema these days. It's really not worth the expense or the bother, it seems, when you read the press reports of attempts to add scent. And really here, when you look at the literature, it seems that the addition of an extra sense to this kind of experience uh, runs into problems both of information processing limitations that audiences find it difficult to deal with a, uh, a rapid sequence of scents. There are sort of physical problems of all these scents. How do you introduce them and clear them quickly enough? So many of these kind of events end up with a horrible mess of smell. Um, and uh, kind of technical limitations about how you deliver scent uh, as well. So they're both human and sort of technical limitations uh, that have partly explained why it hasn't caught on. And I think also what I see is that even if I could prove in an experiment that adding scent to cinema was led to a better experience for the viewer, 
I don't suspect that the audience would see it that way. They would rather say it was just a better film. Better film. I, I enjoyed the action. Uh, so this is what I call kind of the fundamental misattribution error that I fear that it's going to be hard to convince people of the benefits of adding scent to arts and entertainment because we will attribute our pleasures uh, to the wrong sense, possibly. Um, moving on to, to, to sort of another kind of situation, um, sense in the context of live performance, sort of theatre and opera, plays, uh, dance and such like, then uh, again, there's a very long history of the introduction of scent. Um, and here it feels it's been a bit more successful than it ever has been in the case of the cinema or of the museum. And yet at the same time, um, uh, work by uh, Sally Baines has got a sort of wonderful article just documenting the various reasons why you might add scent to live performance setting. And she sort of argues against the most obvious kind of pleonastic use of, of just adding the scent of the thing that you see on stage. That is kind of utterly boring um, and pointless. And yet that is primarily what has been done in the case of the cinema. Instead, she says, you know, the best uses of an extra sense in this kind of art experience is to tell jokes, to set a context, a mood, an atmosphere, um, or to uh, you know, have multiple meanings uh, going on, uh, or to have a contrast or some sort of disconnect. Uh, between what you see on the stage um, and what the audience experiences, and even to sort of break down uh, the, the fourth wall, she calls it. Beyond that, uh, other arts situations where one might think of introducing more senses are, uh, I think, in the case of musical performance. Um, and yet here, if you look back through history, there are remarkably few attempts to add scent to musical performance. There are a few examples I could find tend to have been inspired by uh, Septimus Piez's um, uh, gamut of odours, his uh, matching, almost synesthetic one might say, but I think importantly not synesthetic, matching of musical notes to specific uh, fragrance notes. And one sees various musical performances where you try and translate music into scent, um, to have scent sonatas uh, and scent symphonies and such like. Um, and here I think you know, the, the, the fact that both scent and music sort of evolve temporarily, that we use the same language to describe music and um, uh, fragrance with top notes, bass notes, harmonies, chords. The language is kind of the same for these two senses. It leads me to think there really ought to be more scented uh, musical performances than in fact there are. So why is it that they don't uh, exist is sort of a, I think a, a, an interesting question uh, for me. Um, and of course, beyond scent, one can also think about adding music to uh, the gallery setting to, 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 to complement a, a, a painting, say. And that is another sort of rich seam of, of research, mostly in academic literature, uh, psychologists over the last half century have attempted to find out whether people match pieces of music to particular works of art or genres or styles or artists or periods. Um, and then sort of explain why and what happens when you present matching or mismatching music while viewing a painting. Does the painting look better? Is it more emotionally impactful? Does the painting's presence change your experience of the uh, music that you are listening to? Here, a, a, a rich literature, um, I think, can be explained on the one hand by saying, yes, there clearly are close matches between um, uh, painting and music. Um, they may be based on correspondences. Um, they're often talked of in terms of synesthesia, I, th I think wrongly. But there are these sort of fundamental similarities between sensations on which people seem to base their matches. The other thing that comes out a lot of this research is the idea of sensation transference, that the reason why you might add music to the painting is that the more that you like the music or the scent that you add, the more you like the art you're experiencing on average. You transfer your feelings about the additional senses uh, to the rated uh, artistic uh, sense. And that can be another uh, reason there. Beyond that, I think um, we've done many events where we have tried to pair music 
with tastes, with flavour, with wines, for example. Here, one event we did with the London Symphony Orchestra, pairing four wines to four classical pieces of music uh, played by quartet live in uh, St Luke's Church in London. Uh, and here, I think what's happening when you combine the senses in this kind of artistic experience is that the music kind of draws people's attention to something in what they are tasting. It's kind of a way of directing attention. So this is another reason why we might want to add um, a sense and sort of captured just by one wine writer's commentary about what was happening when we had music designed to match some very expensive wines. That what seemed to be happening uh, was not that we noticed new flavours when the music changed, but instead the same flavour elements were there all along. But the music seemed to change the way we perceived them. Some music made us pay more attention to astringency, so we disliked the wine. With other music, we chose to ignore the oak and tannin, so we liked it more. So it's adding senses to direct the way that a viewer experiences uh, a work of art, a painting. Uh, as for me, with John Latham's full stop, or in this case, uh, the taste of the wine for music. Other uses I've, I've come across, um, I think sort of two other ones that I'm really interested in at the moment. One is this idea of combining the senses, uh, adding to a unisensory artwork to make it multisensory in order to create harmony or emergent properties from the total sensation. And this may have been, though there's some debate, what Scriven had in mind with his uh, poem of fire and his loose, his colour score to go with the music. And at least according to one writer, the idea was the music would help to disambiguate uh, 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 the music uh, itself uh, and maybe bring out this kind of notion of harmony. Um, and I'm really interested in the question of whether there is such a thing as multi-sensory harmony or whether it only extends to the... Um, auditory modality. And whenever you talk about a harmonious wine or a harmonious music and wine pairing, is that merely metaphor and nothing more? Um, not quite sure of the answer to, to it yet, but it's something we are researching. Uh, the final couple of ways of, of thinking about why one might want to pair or add sensations to make a artwork multisensory. It uh, gets uh, not at harmony, but more at sort of unity and similarity in a way. Um, and here, uh, maybe hinted at by this quote from von Hornbostel in the 1920s, when he writes that what is this essential in the sensuous perceptible is not that which separates the senses from one another, but that which unites them, unites them amongst themselves, unites them with the entire, even with the non-sensuous experience in ourselves and with all the external that there is to be experienced. It's that unity of the senses, almost mystical notion, and maybe some of the attempts to make art multisensory are going down that route. Can they create a unified sensation? And what happens if you perfectly capture uh, a painting in scent or uh, musically match a flavour? Well, uh, one hint here comes from one of my favourite studies, uh, not from art exactly, but about what's called the pitch of harmony, which was an attempt in the 1970s to match the pitch of a tone generator to the taste of a beer, and then play back the pitch of harmony while others tasted that beer and sort of create this unified sensation that's described by the participants as a tone that turned into a tune, thrills of pleasure running through my body. I felt as if my head was expanding in all directions. My hand with a glass of beer and it trembled so violently that I was suddenly afraid of dropping the glass. I felt as if I was floating in the air. All this apparently happening when similar, uh, that unification or similarity of sensations is, is homed in on, in this case, between taste and um, uh, hearing. One kind of extraordinary emotional response that isn't there in a tone generator, that isn't there in a glass of beer, but that emerges when these two uh, inputs somehow unify uh, together. Um, and that's just but one of the, uh, the examples that we're have been working on over the last couple of years of these, you know, trying to add more senses to artistic experiences in order to create something extraordinary, be it the pitch of harmony, or be it in this case with um, Glenn Morangi whiskey, where we worked with video artists in France to try and elicit an ASMR 
an autonomous sensory meridian response uh, in the um, people at home when they're tasting a glass of whiskey and they watch these specially created videos with the texture and the sounds that are designed to trigger that autonomous sensory meridian response and the idea is hopefully if you get it right uh, people will have an extraordinary tasting experience that they would never find. So just to conclude then, um, I think that there are many reasons why one might want to add more senses to um, artistic experiences. There's a question, as David Lomas asked about whether we should be doing it. Uh, is it right, appropriate um, to hack the experience? Uh, but I think the sorts of things we might aim for, if we think it is appropriate to um, hack the art in this way, is possibly to match sensations. Um, but watch out that that isn't just a boring, uh, as Baines po points out. Uh, and maybe it becomes boring when you present the smell of the thing that you see in the work of art. There's nothing no value added there. But when the similarity or match is more synesthetic or based on correspondences, maybe it becomes more interesting as a concept uh, or as a phenomenon. One might use uh, additional senses to kind of contrast with what one sees uh, on the stage, on the screen. Uh, we might, one might add more senses in order to try and uh, create this sort of multi-sensory harmony um, that probably relies on, on a kind of similarity across the senses that may or may not exist, depending on the uh, person you, you, you um, read. Uh, one might um, combine more senses in art in order to try and tap into some emergent property, something that's not there in the original work, that's not there in the augmented senses, but comes out from their combination. And yet this is probably a challenging thing to aim for in as much as um, there's virtually no evidence of multi-sensory, genuinely multi-sensory gestalt phenomena in the gestalt literature. Then uh, one might add those more senses to either help disambiguate the artwork, perhaps the case in Scribbin's Poem of Fire with his loose score, and or to help direct the viewer, if that's the right word, the viewer's attention uh, to something in the experience, and that was happening in some of the works in the Tate Sensorium I think it's very definitely happening in some of our attempts to match classical music with uh, wine. Um, and finally, um, I see others who are attempting to add more senses, be it scent or sound, uh, to, to unisensory, primarily visual uh, art experiences in order to modulate the experience, to enhance or, or suppress the overall thing, to make it more memorable, to make it more emotionally salient. And that may depend on this notion of sensation transfer uh, and that ultimately uh, it may uh, lead to the possibility of delivering these kind of extraordinary art experiences um, that will emerge perhaps only through uh, adding more senses to the experience. And I shall stop. Uh, how do I stop sharing? Let's have a look here. Thank you very much um, for such a rich presentation. I'm sure we'll have a lot of questions and things to discuss during the discussion and everyone will have a chance to ask a question. So please don't forget what you want to ask. Um, during the discussion, you can either raise your virtual hand or write down your question in the chat. Actually, you can even write down your questions even now. But we now have our second speaker. Um, it's Carol Steen, an artist and a professor at Tura College at New York City. Professor Steen's works were displayed in a large number of exhibitions, including the Philadelphia Museum of Art, the Cranbrook Museum in Michigan, the De Cordova Museum in Massachusetts, and 
just to mention a few, Professor Steen uses her own experiences of synesthesia in her artworks and made a significant contribution to the research of synesthesia in general. She co-organized the American Synesthesia Association, which provides information to further research into the area of synesthesia. Thank you very much for accepting our invitation. Um, we are happy to have you here. Um, maybe, Carol, you can try to share your screen, uh, and if it's not working, then we can maybe share your screen from another person's laptop, but maybe let's try using your own screen now. Okay, I'll do my best here. Thank you. <laughs> um, you can see it now, thank you. How does that look? Is it tiny like it was before? Um, I can see it fine. If anyone has any problems, just let me know, but I, I think it's fine. Thank you. OK, thank you very much for inviting me. Um, this was the invitation, um, and I thought about it when I read that you can't hear paintings or touch music. And I thought about that for a second, and I thought, well, actually, some people can. So I began to think about the difference between synesthetic and non synesthetic artists. And four questions came to mind. How do most artists work, whether they're synesthetic or not? What do we have in common? How do artists communicate with their audience? What's the difference about artists who are synesthetic? And do synesthetic artists use their synesthesia consciously? For those of you who may not know much about synesthesia, it's a perceptual ability that's marked by unusual joinings. I'm very sorry to, to interrupt you, but are you moving your slides? Because we can only see your first the first slide. Oh, really? Then you better do it. Yes, I can only see a black screen. Yeah. Oh, no. Oh, there it is. That's yeah. not going to work. All right, you want to take over then? And I will. Yeah, it's okay. It's okay. You can continue. Just if I just have a feeling that the slides are not moving. Right. So do you want to do it? We're on slide four. Yeah, thank you. OK. Good, so. Right, next one, please. Great. OK, so we saw this things when we have these experiences, we don't do something to bring it on it's involuntary and we also can't shut it off next where do we see these things well uh scientists describe it as in the mind's eye but i think of it as the same place where we watch our daydreams 90 percent of the time what we see is internal but sometimes we actually see the experience externally most of the time, since these will say it doesn't change, it's memorable. Um, scientists have this great word for it, photism, which is luminous visions, and they are. And oftentimes we'll feel a sense of excitement or joy when we experience these things. Next. Next, please. Yeah. There are at least 70 different forms of synesthesia that we know about, or one person in 23 or 4% of the population experiences one or more forms. And on average, a synesthete has three to four forms, though some have more. Next. A little background. Next. I'm an artist and a synesthete, and I see moving colored shapes from sound, from smell, from touch, and from pain, and I read in technicolor. Next. Um, I haven't always used synesthesia to create my work, but when I do, I'm working from sound or music or from what I see from the touch of the acupuncturist needles. Next. There was also a time when I hid from these visions and worked as most artists do. This was me in my metal studio in Detroit, Michigan, many years ago. Next. So how do most artists work, whether they're synesthetic or not? Are there commonalities? Next. 
I think of artists who are not using synesthesia as being on the outside looking in. Next. And those who don't have synesthesia, <clears throat> excuse me, or who choose not to use it, work from what they see looking outward that they bring inward. Next. We use what we know, what we've seen or felt personally. Next. We use our ideas, our experiences, our impressions. Next. And we find the right tools and technology that make it possible to create what we want to show. Next. The things we choose to explore are generally known. And because they're known, others have experienced them. We might begin with talking to a friend and saying, I have this idea, I'd like to paint this, or I saw this really fabulous landscape that I want to paint. And you expect a certain level of understanding because you're speaking the same language. They know what you're talking about. Next. So how do artists communicate with their audiences? Next. And this is important. One of the main things art has to do is to get you to look and not just for 10 seconds, the sculptor Adam Pendleton wrote, and he's absolutely right. You know, you go outside, you look around you and you're bombarded all the time. Uh, things you have to pay attention to, things that are demanding that you pay attention to them and using every possible way to get you to pay attention. Next. So sometimes artists will use more than just visuals. Next. And while art's usually considered a primary visual experience, an artist will do anything to try to attract an audience to communicate. And that's really the key word, to communicate. So sometimes artists will use sound or touch or kinetics in addition to visuals. Next, visuals and sound. Next, there's a show currently up at the Rubin Museum of Art in New York City, and sound is material invisible, but very visceral and emotive. It can define a space at the same time that it triggers a memory. Next, please. Harry Bertoya was an artist uh, who worked with sound. Next. And his pieces were meant to be played as instruments. He would put together these rods, they would sway, they would chime. Sometimes he would put them out into nature and let the wind uh, trigger the sound. Next. Next. Some artists would use kinetics, next. And John Tengley was a Swiss artist, next please. And he began to create these assemblages. He was very much interested in the industrial revolution and mechanization, and he put them together and animated them. Next please. And what he found that happened was that the viewer became part of the piece. The viewer would focus on which part was moving, which part might be making a sound, and they would wander around through the presentation to see what was going on. And in a way, because of that, the viewer became part of the installation, not just a passive viewer. Next, please. And Calder did the same thing. Next, please. Next. Some artists use smell. This is not done very often. And you can either put together a smell with the sculpture or something that's wonderful or something that's going to offend. Next, please. So, 
Anika Yi, who has a show up at the Tate right now in Turbine Hall, Tate Modern, uh, also works with Smell. And a show that she did in 2016. Next, please. She worked with Smell, and she said that she described her work as smelly, impermanent, bodily, microbial, uncomfortable. Next, please. And in the sculptures she was doing, these scents would come off, these pungent aromas. And at the time, she's a New York artist. Um, New York was kind of worried about Ebola coming here. This was in 2016. And there was this anxiety, not dissimilar to what's happening with COVID right now, and kind of a threatening gloom. And she wanted to use offensive smells to convey the, the terror of the times. Next, please. Uh, at Spurney Westwater here in New York, Wolfgang Leib built these structures, uh, beeswax coated uh, wooden understructures, and he created this ziggurat. And when you walked into the show, there's this very soft scent of beeswax. Uh, it was inviting. One felt one wanted to go and touch the sculpture. Next, please. And then, of course, space. Next, please. Uh, Yayoi Kasama does some wonderful uh, infinity mirrored rooms where the viewer again becomes a participant, becomes part of the sculpture. And unfortunately, sometimes her work gets destroyed when viewers are taking selfies and they get a little bit too close and trip over things. Next, please. And this was Lucas Samaris's mirrored room and you walked into this cube, which was equally mirrored on the inside. And again, you became spectator and participant. Next, please. And Nika Yi has a show up at the Tate. Currently, she worked with Hyundai. They commissioned her. And these are drones that are floating around. But at the same time, she has scent coming out of different parts of the turbine hall. And if you read the descriptions of it, it talks about different periods of time going way, way back, all the way up to current time. Next, please. And these things are just moving around. They respond to proximity and to heat. Next, please. So what's different about artists who are synesthetic? Next, please. Well, synesthetic artists work pretty much the same way that non-synesthetic artists do, but there's one really important difference. Next, please. And that is synesthetes can see without using their eyes. For example, if you smell something or hear something or touch something, you can see colors, you can see shapes, you can see movement in the same place you watch your daydreams. Next, please. And I call this the inside looking out. Next, please. So artists who have synesthetes, synesthesia, they're often working from what they see inward, which they bring outward. Next, please. When I went to the Rubin Museum and I heard the gong, I saw the most beautiful magenta. That's true. Next, please. But what do synesthetes see? Next, please. In simple terms, the shapes we see are kind of blobby. Uh, they're simple. They're not figurative. The colors we see are the colors of light, which is much brighter than the colors of pigment. It's what you see when you're looking at your computer screen. Those are the colors of light. We see shaped colors. They appear suddenly, and they move on a background, kind of like watching a movie. Next, please. 
We do see soft edge 3D shapes. They exist in space, but they do not cast shadows. They have textures, they occur in layers, and how fast they move depends on what's triggering the seeing of them. Next, please. Sometimes synesthetic artists are not conscious they're using their visions, or we might not want to tell somebody. Next, please. And when you're a synesthete and you don't know anything about it, which is what happened to me when I was seven years old and told my best friend that the letter A was the prettiest pink I'd ever seen, and she stopped talking to me, you think, is this real? Did I make this up? Am I crazy? So silence is safer, and you keep your perceptions private. Next, please. And I wasn't the only one who kept my secret. The American painter Charles Birchfield coded his paintings. And he was married, and he had five children. And he didn't tell anybody what he was seeing. And he said that sometimes he felt like he should be a composer of sounds, because sometimes when he's walking through the forest, the colors he saw made sound. Next, please. When you look at this painting, maybe the first thing that you look at are the telephone wires, which kind of look like they're vibrating. But his intent was to focus on the telephone pole. And the pole, he said, even though it was once a tree living and now cut down and becoming a telephone pole, still had life in it and it pulsated. Next, please. So he created a code of symbols that he could put his sounds and his emotions into his paintings. Next, please. There's a wonderful researcher and scholar of Birchfield at the Birchfield Penny uh, Art Center in Buffalo, New York. And this is one of the uh, pages from the copious journals that um, Charles Birchfield told his secrets to, and he says that this is the horn call from the Sibelius. It comes from the northeast autumn land. So in order to understand Birchfield's work, you have to know he's a synesthete and you have to have the code translated. Next, please. And these were more journal notes. He's talking about Wagner. Next, please. Birchfield had sound that gave him colors and shapes. He had shapes that gave him emotions and smell had color and shape and time existed in space for him. Next, please. Next, please. Joan Mitchell was a very private painter. She had a studio in France. And you'll notice, next please, that her paintings uh, were done in a studio where burlap covers the windows. She also slept with the key to her studio under her pillow. She listened to music. She worked at night. She was an idetiker, um, which could be a blessing or a curse because she forgot nothing. And in the morning, she would go to her studio to review what she had painted the night before. And if she had left something out, being a person with this incredible memory, she could just paint it back in. Next, please. So for her, sound had color, personality had color, emotion had color, graphemes had color, and she wasn't identical. Maybe that's why she drank so much, because all of us have done things we'd like to forget. Next, please. Vincent Van Gogh. Yeah. Next, please. Next, please. He wrote a lot of letters. He wrote letters not only to his brother Theo, but to other people. And in it, he would put some statements that sounded like synesthesia. Some artists have a nervous hand at drawing, which gives their technique something of the sound peculiar to a violin. I love the statement, 
Millet is perhaps a stately organ. Next, please. Kandinsky, next, please. Between 1880 and the 1920s, synesthesia was known in Europe, and Kandinsky knew what synesthesia was. And he was able to talk to poets and painters and musicians, composers, who had the ability, and he could compare notes. Next, please. He was an unusual synesthete in that color had sound, and sound also had color but they didn't necessarily correlate, and personality had shape as well. Next, please. David Hockney. Next, please. Your brilliant David Hockney uh, is not talking about synesthesia too much, but in 1981, he talked to uh, an interviewer at Art Forum magazine here in New York, and the uh, article uh, was printed, and Richard Saitok, a uh, synesthesia researcher here in the States, uh, read the interview and thought, hmm, there's something interesting here. And he sent a letter to Hockney, and he said, I think that you might have synesthesia. Well, Hockney walked around with the letter in his breast pocket for about two or three months and finally contacted Saitok and said, okay, come out to my LA studio. So Saitok went out there and he tested Hockney. And David Hockney is a synesthete, whether he's talking about it or not. Next, please. He has sound to color, sound to shape, sound to movement. Unfortunately, David Hockney has a profound hearing loss and nobody seems to know how that has affected his synesthesia, or if it has. Next, please. So what are the various forms of synesthesia? There are common forms and rare forms. Next, please. So there are about four that many, many synesthetes will say that they have. They have letters and numbers in color. They have days of the week, months of the year in color. Musical sounds could have color, general sounds could have color, musical notes. There's some differences here. There's pitch that gives some synesthetes color, and then there's timbre, which gives some synesthetes color, and then there's just general noise, rumbling trucks on a New York City street trying to beat a light. Next, please. So as you can see, there a great many uh, forms of synesthesia that have been documented, and there are even more than when Sean Day documented these maybe 10 years ago. Next, please. Next, please. And last one. Thank you. Heinrich Kluver was an experimental psychologist, and he worked in Chicago at the university in the 1920s. He did an experiment. Next, please. He took mescaline, and he had a control group take mescaline as well. And we know that mescaline will give you hallucinogenic visions. And he wanted to know, what is it that people saw? Did they see the same things? And he discovered that we do. And they called these basic patterns of perception form constants. Next, please. And he had these diagrams. There were three. I'll show you two. Next, please. And synesthetic artists are using these uh, whether they recognize it or not, and they may not know that how they're building their art is also being shared by other synesthetes who are seeing the same things. Next, please. So this is where we need the animation. There are two of them. What I'm showing you in the diagrams are linear forms, but I'd like to show you what a synesthete actually does see. Next, please. So we might see this 
and it moves and it changes. It's arbitrary and it's capricious. Next, please. The colors could suddenly appear. It moves within itself. Things sometimes occur on top of it. There could be a color shift and then it just disappears. There's nothing, next please, that we can do to make it stay. We can't control this at all. Next, please. So you have synesthesia, and if you want to work with it, there are some challenges. There are some rules that when you're taught as an artist the traditional way, uh, you're taught do this, don't do that. And there are expectations. Next, please. We're taught there are established practices. You should be aware of the prevailing aesthetic zeitgeist. You should use certain tools this way, not that way. And working techniques. Next, please. You're also taught what's an accepted source of inspiration. Next, please. You can work from the real visible world. You can work from landscapes. You can work from still lives. You can work from portraits or creatures. Next, please. You can work from your dreams or your imagination. Next, please. You can work from an extension of motor activity, meaning how far can you draw a line with the pencil or the chalk attached to your fingers and your arm fully extended and what happens with the line when you're fully extended and then to draw your arm in close to your body. That kind of thing. Next, please. You can also consciously manipulate images to explore concepts like cubism. Next, please. But you may not know if you're a synesthetic artist that there might be reasons why you want to work in a specific way with some shapes or textures or colors or forms. Next, please. I certainly wasn't taught to use the visions from my synesthesia, and this affected my work. Next, please. I was told how to mix paint. There's no way when you're listening to music you mix a color and then you apply it to the brush and then you use the brush to apply it to canvas. You don't have time. Next, please. So I don't use brushes. Next, please. And I don't use painting mediums. Next, please. And I don't mix the colors. I don't have time. I mix them on the canvas. Next, please. And here's a piece that I actually made. Uh, you're going to see it being formed. There was a wonderful Japanese trumpet player by the name of Kondo Tashinori, and I was waiting in this 15-second clip to see his trumpet. So you're going to see me working on a painting that will be upside down to you, and I'm putting in the percussion. Next, please. Next, it should go, yeah. So the drums, the cymbals, the bass is what I'm putting in now. And I'm finally beginning to hear the, the trumpet, which for me is red, and I'm putting that in. And this is what the painting looks like. Next, please. So how do synesthetic artists create? Next, please. Well, it's a multi-dimensional, multi-sensory nature of synesthesia that makes us use idiosyncratic methods, things that would not be taught in a traditional art school, which is one that I went to. Next, please. And that's because the colors and shapes we see, they change abruptly and we don't have a choice. We've got to get what we're seeing onto the canvas quickly. And anytime you mix color, you dull it. So if you're mixing color, maybe you should do it more optically than 
actually blending different colors together. And I was always taught, don't leave any of the canvas exposed, cover everything. But when my shapes vanish, the background that I was watching them on, it shows. So it's truthful to what I'm seeing to leave blank spaces. Next, please. Carol, really sorry to interrupt you, but we have very little time left. Can you please just maybe conclude the most important things you wanted to say? Yeah, what slide Thank are you. we on now? Sorry, what slide number are we on? Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I can't see the, the totality of the slides. Okay, let me run through it fast, see where we are. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay, let me, can you go to, all right, just go quickly and I'll tell you where to stop, okay? All right, <clears throat> keep going. <clears throat> so what these are showing, <clears throat> excuse me, are shows, <clears throat> okay, stop there, yeah. OK. Um, this is a Birchfield painting <clears throat> that was the cover for the Whitney retrospective in Nancy Weekly was kind enough to translate the code of symbols in there, which are all synesthetic. Uh, last slide then. Next. OK. So. In summary, the outside is where most artists exist. We get an idea, a dream, we have a feeling, something that we want to communicate. We find the tools and technology. And when we're working from the outside, we want others to feel our ideas. But in the inside, where the synesthetes exist, we already have this multimedia experience going on, and we want to share it. We want to bring it outside and make it visible so that others could see what we see. And so if you're a synesthetic artist, you want others to feel our visions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for such a rich and interesting presentation. We are now starting the discussion. So we usually start the discussion by asking both of our speakers to comment or maybe ask questions on each other's presentations. So uh, Charles, do you maybe want to begin? Um, yeah, I don't have anything specific uh, to ask. Carol? Um, I would just like to say that uh, artists and synesthetes, so synesthetic artists, there are four different ways you can put this together. You can work from what you see outside that you bring in. You can work from what you see outside and it stays on the outside. You don't internalize it. You just simply try to copy as best as possible, putting your own particular style on it. Uh, since these can work uh, from a vision out on the outside that they're trying to find uh, and bring inside also, which gets augmented by the multi-dimensional experiences that they already have. So there are four different ways that this can happen. But the most important point that I'd like to make is that synesthetic artists are not copying what they see because you can't. And the reason that you can't copy what you see is that it happens in a split second and as great as your memory might be, you cannot remember everything that you've been seeing. You have to synthesize it and put forth the most truthful uh, representation of what you're seeing, if that is your intention. But synesthetic artists are not obvious. We can't be. Thank you. Um, if anyone has a question, tell me. In our time, you can either raise your virtual hand and I'll give you a chance to speak or write down a question in the chat. Um, in the meantime, I have the first question to ask maybe to Charles, I think. Um, 
and maybe to Carol as well. So what you were speaking about, how artists or how we can use different modalities to change our perception of art. The, um, with smiles, we can use in art galleries or in the cinema. But what about how artists only using one modality, such as only using visual painting, can make us still associate different senses with it? So it's just a painting, it doesn't have any scent, any smell or anything else, but still mm -hmm. people start associating things with it. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I guess there, uh, oftentimes um, over the last century or so, there's an attempt to use the synesthesia to try and convey uh, sounds visually, say. Um, and one might think of the Kandinsky as mentioned in that line. But for me, I'm more interested in um, the use of these correspondences instead to try and convey meaning. And so for that, I often sort of contrast um, uh, Kandinsky with uh, Arthur Dove, who's sort of painting from 1929 Foghorns. It's just you know, three big black circles on the, on the waves. And I think, I think it's sort of you know, conveying the notion of a very loud, very low pitched sound, but doing it purely uh, visually. Um, and I guess there are other examples uh, like that uh, in the world of, I think, you know, in the world of design, I'm trying to convey um, attributes or qualities uh, in the other senses, purely visually. So it can be done, it's done. But at the same time, Arthur Dove is not a very famous artist. So you wonder whether going using correspondences as the route to try and evoke other senses. Uh, maybe other Dove wasn't such a good artist. <laughs> maybe that's it. Or is, is there maybe less interest in that kind of approach than in those who, who talk about their synesthesia and use that as an, an inspiration uh, and view into a into um, uh, another uh, world. Um, but I mean, I, sort of, you know, I mean, looking back in sort of the history of, uh, of sort of you know, uh, color music and the like, sort of time and time again, it sort of feels to me that there's sort of what I see is sort of a distraction into the world of synesthesia as people try and communicate. Um, and I want to sort of bring people back and say that the correspondence is these shared meanings is going to be a more effective means of communication than all, than the more idiosyncratic experiences of the synesthete. Um, Thank you. Um, I can see we have a question from Marcus. Marcus, do you want to ask your question, please? Yeah, many thanks. Um, thanks for the two talks and also thanks to the organizers for letting me participate. I'm joining in from Düsseldorf. So thanks for that. Um, I have I have a question to each of, of you. Um, Charles, to you, my question is, you focused at least in your talk on the Aristotelian a classical Aristotelian outer senses, taste, smell, touch, vision, and audition. And I was just wondering whether in your research um, you also focus on proprioception or interoception, i.e. Uh, those perceptions of our inner body feelings of uh, balance, muscle tension, mm -hmm. etc. Because it's quite en vogue with artists nowadays uh, to focus on these um, inner perceptions. Think of Carsten Hurler's uh, test site in the Tate Modern two 2006 slides mm -hmm. within the yeah. turbine hall where you experience your body. So that would be my question whether you have a focus there too. Um, so not in, I haven't looked at the effect of uh, adding other senses to proprioceptive or kinesthetic or internal sensations. Though I do have a folder of stuff here on um, sort of, you know, tactile proprioceptive entertainment uh, but that's sort of taking me into in, into more into the uh, you know the world of the fairground and theme park rides and the helter skelter for example on the tate yeah, um yeah. so you know, sort of tactile pleasures and i think there's um yeah i i i sort of get a sense of that growing interest from the artists uh, in those other senses um but maybe there isn't so much out there today um, and maybe I'm more interested in that sort of interface between more sort of the entertainment use of incorporation of proprioception and, and, and kinesthetics and, and touch rather than the um, artistic one. Um, 
yeah. and of other senses. I suppose you know, there's guess there are in, maybe there are 40, 45 senses. Who knows how many? Depending if you combine the internal and the external. So there's always more room to to to, to play. Um, and you know whether one might say something about the pheromonal sense. Should we subsume that under regular smell? And, but maybe we shouldn't because you know maybe some of those smell artists are very much uh, Cecil Tollis, for example, much more in sort of the bodily odours, um, mm -hmm. perhaps attempting to target the pheromonal uh, uh, route. Yeah, cheers, thanks. May I ask this second question to Carol, or is there a list? Uh, OK, uh, thanks. Um, my question here would be on, on a certain phenomenology. Um, if I got you right, then certain letters look a certain color to you. Let's let's say an A looks green. OK, now my my question is, what does it do to you if you print that letter in a kind of opposite color, like in a bright red? So that the letter is printed, the A is printed in a bright red, uh, but usually you experience A's as green. What kind of phenomenology conjures that up in, in you when you when you look at such weird letters, which must be weird letters to you, or colors at least? Uh, that taps into what they call the Stroop interference test, which is one of the tests that's used to determine if someone really is a synesthete or not. You give them a letter or a number in the wrong color for them, and you time them, they are slower. So I have to translate. It's always a process of translation, of taking the wrong color and the wrong letter and uh, making it right. So that'll slow me down. Um, the Nobel Prize winning physicist uh, Richard Feynman is quoted as having said that uh, his numbers and letters were in color and he would write these equations and he would see them flying around in space and he said, and I wonder what the hell the students see. So for him, things were in color. If you were to put the wrong colors, let's say in an equation on a chalkboard, uh, a synesthete would be markedly slowed down because it's always translation. Uh, okay, very interesting. Many thanks. Thank you, Bill. And um, we have another question for Marty Sophie. Do you want to ask your question, please? Hi, can you hear me well? Cool. Yes. Okay, well, thank you very much, first of all, for these uh, wonderful presentations and uh, for organizing this series. It's been really great. Um, First of all, Marcus Schrenk, um, great questions. I'm actually working on both of the questions that you posed. I'm working on uh, gravity and balance in art, but that's something else. So I have two questions for the speakers. Um, maybe kind of thinking along on those lines, uh, Carol, that you, Carol, that you were mentioning. So first of all, um, can you maybe elaborate a little bit about uh, the subjectivity or objectivity of um, the artworks that you are presenting, both um, Professor uh, Spencer as well. And the second question is about the durability or the time of art. Do you want to the viewer to experience those artworks uh, similar to yours? Oh, that's more the subjective question, but uh, especially in the multi-sensory uh, experience, do you want it to be a long experience or have you thought about that at all? That was just those are just thoughts that I had. So maybe you can reflect on that a little bit. Thank you. Uh, what artists try to do is to communicate. There are two problems, one of which is you can't choose your audience. Your audience has to choose you. Um, you could have an idea of what you want someone to get from your work but every time I've had a show, I've been astounded by the reactions that I get to it. Some people go really deep into the work, they get it on some level, and others bring up things that I didn't know I had put in the work, but they find them also. So I have absolutely no idea how my work is going to be received 
when I put it out there. And it's a source of constant terror. It's like, oh, I'm having a show. What's going to happen now? I don't know. I've been lucky. The response has been really good, but I'm not in control. <laughs> Um, well, I guess I think s some of the experiences, more center experiences, um, that are more of the sensorium, sense exploration type, where you sort of put people into environments with different kinds of sensory stimulation. Um, maybe I hope it's, there is no right answer in a sense to some of the things that are proposed, uh, because for an arcade, you know, sweet doesn't have a color, doesn't have a sound attached. And if we put people in environments where these different sensations are sort of brought together, uh, hoping that uh, those who experience them will find that they match or that they harmonize or unify, but not convinced that they will. Um, and so maybe part, part of the hope is just to have people introspecting on their own experience and these surprising connections that everyone shares and uh, uh, or, or that many people share i should say um and, and getting them to think about that but but at the same time sometimes you know when we work with chefs uh we also want there to be some disagreement between people why did you say um you know red was sweet i thought red it should be spicy instead and having that conversation at a meal table rather than in an art gallery uh then I think generate some interesting discussions that wouldn't happen if everyone agreed on the the color of the shapes of the tastes of pitch uh, in, instead. Um, but in terms of their uh, longevity, uh, yeah, I, I'm I, I I do wonder a bit whether uh, some of these associations between the senses or correspondences, I presume they they change over the decades. Um, and some of them may come tr become true because somebody says they're true. Um, and hence, you know, it's as so ahead to some of our things that I've been trying to look back over over the decades or the centuries to try and find historic accounts of these surprising matches and show that, you know, 100, 200, 300, 500 years ago, when people were trying to describe the planets in terms of tastes, which some of them strangely did. Then they will sort of match the color of the planet to their taste in a way that equates with what people say today when they try and match colors and tastes. Um. Thank you. I'm sorry, I'm not, I'm not interrupting anyone. Carol, you wanted to say something? Yeah, I was thinking. Um... I've been lucky to have some really fine mentors in my life. And one of them was a museum curator who was the mentor to Robert Maplethorpe and also mentored to me. And when I was having a show, he would come and help place the work. You put the work around the, the gallery and uh, you position it before you hang it on the walls. And uh, he taught me a couple of interesting things. He said that the first piece that you see when you walk into a gallery is really important because it sets the tone for people's expectations for the rest of the show. And the last piece that you see when someone is leaving the gallery does exactly the same thing. It reinforces it. He also said, People tell you that they love the color green, but they will not buy a green painting. <laughs> They'll buy a red one. And I don't know why, but it's true. I have some green paintings and I've sold the red ones. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Carol. Okay, um, we have another question from Editeria. Can you please ask your question? Yes, um, hello. Um, I have a question for uh, Charles Spence. Um, and first of all, thank you for these very interesting presentations. Um, so my question is if you've come across um, any cross modal differences in your research um, regarding matches that are considered to be congruent between 
say taste or texture or color, um, smell. I'm wondering about that. Um, so, so far, mostly not. Um, it's true that most of the experiments have been done either 10 years ago, they were all done in Oxford on undergraduates, the kind of weird uh, participant pool of psychological research. Over the last decade, we've been lucky enough to do more stuff um, online and hence in multiple countries. So we have started to try and uh, assess some of these surprising cross-sensory matches or correspondences in three, five, seven, ten countries uh, at the same time, um, looking for uh, similarities and differences. Um, and uh, uh, it's the similarities that come out more than the differences so far. So, for example, at the Science Museum in London, we had 5,000 people rating you know, which colour looked sweetest, and that was the pinkish red, regardless of the continent or the age um, of the participants. Um, it would be more surprising to me when we've ha had musical um, motifs to match sweet, bitter, salty and sour that were created in Germany. Um, when we play those sounds, p p people in North America can decode them. Sort of 77 percent agreement. Yes, that is the sweet piece. That is the salty piece of music. That's the sour one. And then when we tested in India, it was sort of 72 percent agreement again, suggesting more similarities than differences. Um, and maybe the only differences we've seen so far is when we've gone away then from testing people who have a computer and the internet wherever they are, they are in the world to um, did some work with the Himba tribe in Namibia in Cocoa land with sort of no written language, no schools, no supermarkets. And for them, they showed they showed the booba kiki effect like everyone else in the world. But when we gave them um, bitter and sweet chocolate, that everywhere else in the world people say bitter chocolate is angular, sweet chocolate is round, booba, they did the opposite. <laughs> um, and they did something different for sparkling and still water that again everyone everywhere else says sparkling water is more angular and still water is not. And they just didn't show a preference for that. Um, and they are, yeah. So I don't know why that was the case. Is it something about their diet and food culture? Um, but the, to the extent that they did something different there, kind of then led us in to say, well, maybe it isn't about people matching sense stimuli or sensations that are dangerous, like angular stuff and bitter, poisonous stuff, and matching nice things like round things and sweet things. The him are doing something different. Maybe there's a different explanation in that case. Um, but so far, more more commonalities than um, than differences. Uh, uh, yeah, but probably one place we'll find those differences might be when it gets to things like smells that are sweet. Where then, if we live in very different food cultures, uh, it may be that in Europe, um, something like uh, cinnamon and vanilla are sweet. Whereas in some parts of Asia, they may be associated with a different taste. But in that case, those cultural differences can perhaps be explained. Everyone's picking up the regularities of the environment and, and teachers that go together. But those environments are a little different because the food is different in different places. OK, that's interesting. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we have another question from Anton. Anton, please, can you ask your question? Mm, yes, can you see me? Can you hear me? Thank you for both speakers for your marvelous presentation. Very inspiring. I've got two questions, both to Charles and to Carol. Uh, first, Charles, uh, do you think, or what's your take on this? Uh, cross model correspondences and all, all mechanics that we can attach to this, like cross model attention, cross model, and, and multi sensory perception. Is it different from their opposite numbers in aesthetics, in aesthetic situations. I mean, when we perceive an object in mundane life and we perceive a similar object in an aesthetic situation, uh, painted or otherwise visualized, are these two types of perception in principle different or the same? Um, I guess by thinking I, 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 I've treated them as if they are the same. And actually, just over the last um, year or two, 
I have sort of one line of just basic research on mundane objects, everyday events and stimuli like woofing dogs and uh, meowing cats and um, uh, and such like. And there, uh, you're thinking how the senses combine. Well, there is modulation, the emergence, the the unification, um, and and then thinking well, actually all those same principles of cross modal combination that have been studied and articulated and neuroscience understood uh, for basic stimuli. What happens if we just try and apply them into the aesthetic context? And maybe that gives you a good things to look for, for kinds of outcomes that may occur in the uh, museum setting. Uh, so for me, I'm thinking, well, it's, it's fruitful to imagine the same rules and mechanisms apply in both cases. What may differ, I suppose, is um, that in the aesthetic situation, stimuli tend to be more emotionally valenced, whereas circles and squares and triangles aren't very emotive. And hence, for that reason, um, and there was a, the, the idea of this sort of complex correspondences between sound and between music and painting there when you try and match paintings to pieces of music, then it tends to be the emotional connotation. That becomes the primary driver of people's matches rather than some more perceptual or sensory attribute. Um, so much of that be that weighting towards the more emotional content of in the aesthetic situation that makes it more salient in the observer's experience and hence a more natural thing to match and to connect. Yeah, yes. Thank you so much. Thank you for your answer. Yeah, Carol, Carol, my, my question to you now, if you don't mind, it just uh, all synesthetes or at least those synesthetes who are artists or are engaged in, in, in this type of enterprise. They are usually explain that their senses, their perceptions are ineffable. It's kind of difficult to explain, difficult to convey and communicate. In my hunch throughout my research of synesthesia is, um, what is the social value, both on the side of the arts and on, on the side of just human attitude to synesthesia, congenital synesthesia. What is the social value of transcending and communicating this ineffability of congenital synesthesia to you as an artist? Anytime an artist creates something, they're creating from what they know, and what they feel, and what they hope. And they're trying to reach other people. Um, I think that synesthetes have things in common with non synesthetes in the depth of the experience that you would like to put into your work somehow, if you can. Um, that is the issue the ineffability of art, um, in the same way that. Uh, Two synesthetes will perceive a stimulus quite differently from each other. Uh, for some, a trumpet sound is red, and to others, it's a different color. Um, it's it's just very difficult, Anton, to to try to know how you're communicating and what you are communicating to another person. It doesn't stop you from trying, but there are no guarantees. OK, thank you so much. At least thank you for trying. <laughs> good to see you, Anton. Me too, it's just good to see you too. Well, we're uh, almost at the end of my uh, uh, all of our um, Oh, that was was there another question, Julian? We have like three minutes. If uh, if we can squeeze it in, that that will be okay. Try to be quick. It's a question for Professor Spence. I was asking myself. You mentioned the link between music and painting. It might be an emotional one. 
And in this context, I was thinking that interception or interceptive input might play a role. Is there um, any, um, is there, are there any efforts uh, within the research of multisensory perception to pursue this question in particular? I mean, the input of um, interceptive um, or the role of interceptive input, which is connected to emotions. Mm -hmm. um. Well, I wondered, you know, are there groups of individuals out there, more or less, uh, uh, either effectively, emotionally, um, interceptively aware? And if so, does that mean that they, some sort of interest, you know, for example, those on the autism spectrum, maybe they have a less um, feeling And hence that might lead them to be unable to make, to not have the the feeling on which to say why this pair of things go together that others have. So what is that feeling that that that, that people have when they say, yep, yeah, that is the perfect pitch for that pint of beer? When there's no objectively right answer, there's a consensual answer. I think other people would say the same as me, but what is that, what is that feeling? Um, uh, and if you don't have, so yeah, so I think on the one hand, yeah, I'm interested. You know, do autistic, autistic individuals not have some kinds of correspondences? Maybe some that are more based on this emotional feeling, um, and also are there others at the other end that maybe the designers of this world, maybe they are just willing to put more weight on their sort of feelings about things matching or their their, their interceptive their gut feel, as it were. Um, but I haven't seen any uh, other than those. I haven't really seen much research effort yet to try and, you know, take people and either sort of you know, turn on or turn off their interceptive um, stuff. I don't know whether under anesthesia, under you know, local anesthesia, would you lose the ability to to do Boober and Kiki? Um, I don't know. I guess that's uh, an open question where <laughs> it's nice to <laughs> uh, to wrap up our conversation. Uh, thank you so much for both our speakers. Thanks, to Carol, to give us such a great insight on um, kind of an artist's perspective on, on this, uh, and Charles to um, to show your research. Uh, um, I would like just to uh, remind um, everyone that we will meet next week uh, and we'll talk about art and science collaborations uh, with Professor uh, Bagamans uh, and AMK Vicky. Um, so I would like, yeah, thank you very much for um, your for attending. And yes, ne next week we'll meet at 10 a.m. So just reminding. Um, and I'm going to stop um, recording.